The following podcast is a production of Commercial Investment Real Estate Magazine, the official publication of CCIM Institute. For more on the latest trends, best practices, and continuing education in all areas of the industry, visit our website at ccim.com and sign up for our education e-newsletter. Welcome to another episode of Commercial Investment Real Estate Podcast. I'm Nicholas Leiter, Senior Content Editor of the magazine. In this episode, you'll hear from Michael Beckerman, CEO of CRE Tech, a leading event, data, and content platform focused on technology in commercial real estate. Speaking with Larry Guthrie, CCM Institute's Director of Communications, Michael discusses how industry technology can help commercial real estate respond to a rapidly changing world. With the global health crisis and resulting economic instability unavoidable, this new reality may accelerate the adoption curve for new technologies and boost investment in potential solutions. Hi, I'm Larry Guthrie, Director of Communications for CCIM Institute, and I'm here with Michael Beckerman, CEO of CRE Tech, a global leader in live events, research, and thought leadership in built world innovation and technology. Thank you for joining me today, Michael. Thank you so much for having me, Larry. I'm a huge fan of CCIM, and it's a real privilege and pleasure to be with you uh, today. We appreciate that. Um, I wanted to take some time to pick your brain on what technological advances commercial real estate professionals should be jumping on this year and what they should be looking forward to in the near future. And maybe more importantly, how are they going to impact the way CRE pros do business in the future? And then, of course, recognizing the elephant in the room, we now have this disruption of the pandemic happening. And what does that do to the whole equation? I mean, we can fit that all into a half hour, right? (laughs) Absolutely, we can. (laughs) So where to start? So Michael, I read in CRE Tech's 2019 end year report that 2019 was a breakthrough year for the real estate and tech industry with venture capital investment hitting a record high of $31.5 billion globally. But that growth isn't necessarily isolated to 2019. The report also noted that VC investments have increased by more than 227% since 2018. That's quite a jump. So that begs the question, what is driving this unprecedented investment by venture capital and prop tech? Thanks, Larry. That's indeed a great place to start. So if we just take a step back, you know, since we've been Um, building this real estate technology community over the past few years, um, we've seen just an extraordinary increase in the amount of funding and the amount of startups that are active today. And um, and, and, and adoption has been coming along um, as well. Um, And so the industry itself, the largest as measured by global GDP in the world, um, has been a laggard in terms of technology and innovation. Why? Because of obvious, it's been the greatest bull market in, in, in history uh, for real estate in particular. So there has not been this sort of impetus uh, to, for, to force companies to want to adopt. But I think one of the things that we saw was that you looked at the early adopters, they were the blue chip big brands within the ecosystem, the largest brokerage firms, the largest uh, landlords and investors in the space. And when they started to uh, really look at uh, how to streamline their operations, how to get better uh, in terms of how they communicate with their employees, how they communicate with their clients, how they transact, started to realize that there were some indeed some great benefits to adopting innovation early. Um, so we started to see the investment really be driven from within the ecosystem. And I think that's one of the most unique aspects of the commercial real estate tech uh, uh, industry is that in a, in a lot of other industries, the investment was coming from outside the industry. In our industry, it was coming from within. So all the major firms uh, in our industry were actually investing and adopting. And so... Naturally, as more and more started to uh, show some success in adopting, others came and got more active. So the numbers, you know, in 19 were, were just extraordinary. I mean, when I got in the ecosystem, say in 2012, 13 initially, there was $50 million invested. 
Fast forward last year, over $35 billion. When I got in the industry around that same time, 2011-12, there were a handful of startups. To date, there have been 7,000 startups that have gotten funding. So the progress from the investment side of the business has been uh, astounding. And um, while, again, as you identified the elephant in the room with the pandemic, you know, there's going to be some, some clear uh, implication in the funding and the adoption side, which we'll, I'm sure we'll get into. But, you know, the, the progress is real. The, the, um, the types of technology that are out there are, are really inspiring and real progress being made from an investment and adoption perspective. I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. And with all of that money, you know, the report notes that three particular areas of concentration are happening in investment. It's uh, looking like 55% is prop tech, 27% is construction tech, and 18% in real estate finance. Are any of these buckets, are they on the rise? And why are they on the rise? And uh, let's go ahead and note that I'm sure your answer two months ago might be very different than what you're going to share now, given the pandemic. Well, when I think about um, what we witnessed in 2019 in terms of where the investment dollars went, um, I don't think that there's going to be any significant change in uh, the directions of where venture and, and, and investment's going. Um, I think some parts of the industry will actually accelerate, uh, given the, the, the new reality of the times we're living in. But I think. Um, if you look at the categories, you know anything that's related to uh, streamlining a, a transaction, anything related to enhancing the construction uh, processes, or anything related to capital, I think are going to continue to draw the lion's share of investment dollars uh, for the foreseeable future. If, if not... Again, given the pandemic, we might even see more dollars chasing sort of fewer categories, but they might be scaling faster as a result of just the changes in the way that people are going to be working uh, remotely um, and um, you know the, the opportunities that are going to exist just in the real estate market now. There'll be new opportunities for investment, for acquisitions, dispositions, leasing, et cetera. So I think the, the real estate industry on the, on the product side uh, it, it, you know, is going to be uh, altered by the pandemic. And therefore, I think the technology side will, will attract dollars uh, that reflect you know, where the activity is, whether it's on the investment sales side or whether it's on the uh, you know, leasing side, et cetera, et cetera, or on the construction side. So I, I, don't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't expect that the categories will change that much. I think some will do better than others, which we can get into. And I think there'll be some new categories. But I think that those buckets that you identified that we saw in 19 uh, that are attracting the, do- the, the majority of the dollars, I think that'll continue. Well, I definitely would love to hear more about the new buckets that are being created. But before we jump on that, I did want to see your thought or hear your thoughts rather on you know, given that we are in a new climate of how we're doing business, you know, this uh, working from home, um, social distancing, those types of things, if this is prolonged and we are continuing to try and do business, are there some technologies out there that we should be aware of to kind of help us during this time to help facilitate these connections? You know, our industry is so much based on trust and that face-to-face, are there technologies that are available that we should be using that can help us during this time? It's a great question, Larry. So I think if, we, if, we, if we're realistic uh, about the changes that this pandemic is going to have on the way that we work as, as humans, um, we have to understand that I think most companies that we work for, we work with, um, they're going to most likely adopt a more flexible workplace strategy for the foreseeable future. I don't think we all are going back to the office tomorrow or next month. I think this is going to be something that we're all going to have to adapt to. 
So given that more people will be working, say, remotely, more people will, will be uh, more companies will adopt more flex time. Um, I think, you know, the companies are going to be looking to disperse locations more. Uh, so it's not so centralized. How do we communicate? Like what types of tools would aid us in this new work environment? I think virtual showings, I think are going to, that's one of the categories that I think will really be more in demand. So any tool that can help people uh, tour space, look at space, build out space, uh, uh, plan space, I think are going to be in huge demand going forward. Um, I think, again, uh, communication tools, not just the virtual meetings and things like that, but, you know, things like where, you know, online leasing platforms or online transactional platforms. I mean, I think, you know, where there is social distancing, but yet there's still a need to transact. Well, these tools, I think, are going to be even more in demand. Um, communications with, um, you know, say on, on the asset management side and, and on the deal flow side, on the investment management side. I mean, there are just wonderful tools that are waiting to be adopted that are, that are ready to go. That I think the industry is going to start to look more for, and I think they will be uh, more in demand given this new environment, because I don't think that in my, my opinion is, uh, help you know maybe I'm wrong. And usually I am. That we're all going right back to work, and everybody's going to occupy all these spaces again. I I, I believe that this is now um, something that every corporation is going to have to approach um, for their workforce, and that means more work from home, more flexible space, and more more you know uh, locations. Actually, I think so. I think the real estate industry. Listen, we're the ones that that are focused on spaces and spaces will never go away. So I think there will be demand for on the transaction side, on the leasing side, as companies relook at their strategies. Um, there'll obviously be dislocation of pain in the economy, but people still have to have a place to live and work. And I think, um, you know, there's going to be some pent up transactions that are going to happen. And I think these tools are available for companies to use to get you know just more efficient uh, along the way. I know there are some existing technologies um, backing up a little bit to some of the information that was cited in your report around construction and real estate by, uh, tech. Can you share some uh, examples of those? Uh, certainly, like construction to kind of help kind of mitigate the ever rising cost in that area. Robotics in construction. You know, construction is one of those areas that everybody can't seem to crack that nut as far as trying to handle the cost issue. So when you we started the podcast, now you were talking about um, the, the sort of the, the major categories where investment was going and, and, you know, what might, what categories might uh, attract more investment dollars in the future. The one that's been on the rise that has the probably the most momentum is construction. And um, it's sort of it's been the lagger just because companies were just trying to focus initially on their core operations in terms of technology, um, um, leasing, investment, uh, communication, things like that. Um, and I think construction now um, and for the foreseeable future is going to attract a significant share of the investment dollars. So, you know, the. The industry is now really focused on where are the inefficiencies in this industry? Um, where can companies find ROI? So every, all the major real estate development companies, construction companies, what, what, the, what the, when they look at technology, their first question is, well, what's the ROI? If I adopt your solution, how is this going to benefit my bottom line? And that's the right question. So, you know, you start to see companies like Procor, which, you know, is, is, is a massively uh, successful company, great scale, bought on its buildings towards the end of 2019, another great startup. You know, they are a single point solution for all of your construction uh, 
uh, technology uh, requirements. And so you could just take a look at their, they're sort of the Bloomberg, uh, for lack of a better word, the Bloomberg of construction tech. But there's also lots of other t- technologies specifically that I think are attracting uh, great adoption, whether it's on the payment side, whether it's on the robotic side, whether things like digital twins technology, um, there, there's so many that I think have just great, great uh, upside. There's also great innovation being made on the affordable housing side using um, te- uh, construction tech. So I think I think we are in the if if the commercial real estate industry as a whole is in the second or third inning of adoption and innovation. I think construction's in the first. And I, I think it's going to be, it's so early, but it's got just great, great upside um, as, a, as a category. And I think great innovations coming on the construction side. That, that is definitely some good news. What specifically, you mentioned that there are some advances there that are really going to make an impact on affordable housing, workforce housing. And that's been a perennial problem as well within commercial real estate. What's coming out? What, how is it impacting in uh, that area? Well, I think if you you know if if you think about things like modular construction, I think if you if you think about things like three D printing, I mean I th- I think there are there's so many ways in which construction uh, technology can can help reduce the cost of of, of housing. Um, uh, I I think that's one of the real reasons why it's going to attract so much investment dollars. I think it's still early, but you know you think about on the material side, on the um, on the automation side, um, on the planning side. I mean, these are all things that are going to hopefully lower the cost of housing, um, and I, I think society as a whole will, will be the big benefactor there. Absolutely. So, what um, out of all the tech advances that you're seeing, if you had to narrow it down to one or two that uh, either came out recently or is scheduled or you see the horizon to when it's going to be coming out shortly which tech advance or one or two tech advances do you see having the greatest impact on the commercial real estate industry kind of how and why i think uh going forward i mean there's so many areas of the industry that i think would benefit from technology that will continue to do well uh, and scale in this environment. In fact, I think some of them will will scale faster. Uh, unfortunately, it's the wrong. You know, you don't wish that it it caused so much pain for for some companies to to grow in this environment, but they will. I mean, that's just a fact. That again, as I said earlier, you know, you start to look at the na- the new nature of work, which I think is going to be somewhat permanent. Um, some companies, whether it's on um, tenant communications. Uh, I think absolutely that's going to do very well. I think if it's on sustainability, absolutely. Anything to do with automation, IoT, absolutely. Anything that that sort of removes the the person to person friction and 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 can can use some of these tools, I think is going to you know do well in this environment. Um, and I think there's some specific ones that I think about like. Um, you know, ghost kitchens, I think is unfortunately going to be a, something that you're going to see more and more of. Um, I think absolutely the virtual tours will thrive uh, in, in this environment. Um, again, I'm talking about, you know, the post pandemic when people get back to work and they see that um, the work, the way that people work is going to be, you know, fundamentally changed for the foreseeable future. I think about transactional platforms so, you know, on the CRE side, we've never had a Zillow. Uh, so I think that there will be uh, this sort of race to build transactional platforms that people can, you know, buy and sell property without touring them using uh, a portal like this and then integrating the virtual tours. I think this is coming and it's going to come fast. Um, and I think, you know, again, all things related to data, I mean, that was was popular in 2019 and that's going to be even more popular in 2020 uh data that is not manually uh organized and assembled is is going to is going to be in greater demand so there's a lot of great great data companies that are um uh, taking data from you know tens of thousands of sources 
and organizing it for real estate companies to make better decisions. So I think all of this is all about giving real estate professionals more tools, more um, insight uh, with the ability to continue to do business just in a, in a really in a, in, a, in a new sort of world, a new new work environment. It's the, it's going to be fascinating to see how it all. It's going to be fascinating. Yes. It's going to be interesting. Change is nothing but constant, my friends. <laughs> might as well embrace now, it, right? Might as well embrace it. And this is where I think technology is people's best friend. I really do. I think that you know, although you know, <laughs> I never would have thought that you know the saving grace for my family while everybody's home during this time has been their social media. <laughs> I always thought that was <laughs> the worst thing ever, you know, with their uh, social media tools. It's actually, it's keeping them in touch with their friends and it's allowing them to communicate and stay somewhat connected. So I think technology um, more so in the future is going to be something that, that we're all going to have to turn to, to adapt more, to use more, given the, the nature of the world today. A follow-up question to that: What industry roles are you uh, do you see being most affected by the advances in technology in the coming years? Like, whose job is really going to change sooner than they think because of these advances in commercial real estate? Wow, that's a great question. So, what I've been saying out on sort of my 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 speaking circuit was: Listen, if you're a real estate broker, if you're a real estate professional, if you're anybody on the services side of the industry, if you're anybody that works for a developer, a landlord, an asset manager, everybody in the ecosystem, you should be, if you really want to future-proof your career, you should be starting to um, you know, research, get familiar and comfortable with a lot of these, these technology tools that are out there. Because those that do will be more in demand and be better equipped in the future as the industries around us that we serve, the corporate world, are in increasing their adoption of things like Slack and, and uh, how they communicate. So corporate America is increasing their adoption of technology and real estate has got to keep up with them. So if you're a professional, have access, have knowledge of these tools that are available. It'll just equip you with, um, you know, it'll, it'll just make you better equipped to Compete. Now that was 2019. 2020. Oh my goodness. If you if you're working from home right now in this environment, you should be spending as much time as you possibly can investigating, researching, connecting with startups and that are out there, talking to your peers, getting best practices, so that you know you can start to be forward thinking. And lean into this as opposed to just being, you know, sitting in the background and getting left behind. So I think it's everybody in the industry should take this as a sort of a, a warning that those that are embracing innovation as core to their own personal uh, job and their company, those people are going to really be the ones that survive and and sadly, you know, as a reflection on this environment, thrive for the foreseeable future because that's what it's going to take. Um, so, you know, the jobs that are going to be in demand, are, I think, are things like chief data scientists, um, CTOs, CIOs. Um, but I, I, I think it's less about a specific job as it is like in your job, if you're not understanding and familiar and comfortable with these tools, then you're going to get left behind because you're now forced at a necessity. Before it was it was good to have. Now, if you don't have it, I think you're putting your own career in jeopardy. Honestly, so you know, I would be on the phone with if I'm a leasing broker, um, I'd be on the phone with my clients, talking to them about some of these tools that are available, and talking about virtual showings or talking about transactional platforms. If I'm an investment sales broker, I'd be talking about some of these asset management, deal management um, platforms that are out there that are thriving. Um, across the board, I'd be, I'd be talking about it. I'd be getting comfortable with it. And this is the time now, more than ever, to be, to be embracing it. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's that uh, old phrase, adapt or die, right? Oh, yeah. Well said. So if uh, certainly 
if you are in a stage where you're being more reactionary in your response to tech, that's easy to, to identify the tech that you should be adopting. But for those individuals and those organizations that are wanting to be more forward thinking with all of the tech that's out there, um, you're wanting to get ahead because that's really the, the goal. But with so much tech out there, how should the companies and practitioners be able, how should they be evaluating which ones to spend the money, the time and the energy adopting? Great. Another really wonderful, insightful question, Larry. So I think that, you know, and this is, this has been true the whole, you know, uh, my whole journey in, in, in the Cree tech sector. So uh, this advice is, was the same advice that I've always given, which is the first thing to understand is that this is not like, you don't outsource this. This is not something you go to like your quote unquote IT department or some young kid and you say, you go figure it out. This has to be culturally, every company needs to embrace innovation, right? And if you look at every industry that's been negatively impacted by technology, it's because they did not get, they did not future proof themselves. They, they, they sort of like let others come into the industry and they didn't adapt quick enough. So the first message is, you know, you have to understand that there are that technology as a whole attacks industries that are inefficient. That's what it does. So whether it's travel or whether it's retail or whether it's banking, what it looks for is inefficiencies. And then these big tech companies, which are already looking at real estate seriously and have been for a while, they're studying the inefficiencies and understanding where are their opportunities because they know it's such a massive industry. So if you look at like fintech, fintech is the best example of an industry that future-proofed itself. And this is where we started this podcast, Larry. So you look at companies like the Goldman Sachs of the world, you know, they were the ones that led innovation into their industry. They did not let it come from without, from outside. It came from within. So they built their own products. They reconfigured their workforce. They eliminated certain types of jobs, but they hired other types of jobs on the data side, on the engineering side. Um, and I think so. So I think culturally, the industry needs to understand that. It needs to start at the top. So all every CEO, every leader within uh, our industry needs to say, I have to be the example and I have to lean into this myself and make this a priority within my company. It's not something you delegate. So having said that, I think the best ways then to approach it, you know, again, if you commit to making this cultural throughout your organization, top to bottom, every single person needs to understand that innovation is core to the DNA of their organization. Then what you really want to start to think about is, where are the inefficiencies within your specific organization? What, what aren't you doing well? What is cumbersome? What is too labor intensive? Um, where are we just wasting money and create, and what, where are there seven steps instead of two? And once you sort of get your head around that, and then you could start to look at, well, given those few areas that we're not, we're not really operating well, what are the applications and solutions that are out there? They're not that hard to find. You could come to Cretech to find it. You could talk to your peers. Uh, you know, we have a massive directory. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy to find you know, the reports like that we did with EY and others. It's, it's pretty easy well organized at this point. So once you if you came in and you said, well, it's on the property management side or it's the leasing side or it's on the the marketing side, you know, it's it, it's pretty well defined who the companies are in those particular categories. And then you start to you you, you just reach out. You reach out. You just, most of these CEOs, most of these tech companies, they're still small enough where you can get leadership on the phone. You get demos. Um, you look for companies, by the way, that uh, can help you on the adoption side. That's very, very, very critical. Those tech companies that have really uh, good teams uh, focused on adoption uh, for their customers, those are the ones that you really, really, really want to gravitate towards. So, you know, customer service and adoption is really critical that you find on the on the startup side, on the tech side. And then you you know you pick a few categories and you just start to roll out. You monitor. Um, you talk to your peers. It's a very collaborative industry. So people are, are willing to talk to each other and give best practices. And 
Um, it's still early enough where, uh, you know, you're going to make mistakes and it's not going to be easy, but there's people here that are willing to help uh, along the way. And I would tell you most, if not all the startups that I interact with, and it's a pretty, you know, there's a sizable number of them. They really, really are committed to helping their clients succeed. And, and so I think, you know, you, you start from the top, you identify some of you know, the pain points within your organization, you find a couple solutions, you, 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 know, you get uh, demos from them, and then you pick a few, you talk to your peers, and you start to adopt. And you change, and you, and you change, and you adapt, and et cetera, et cetera. And that, that's, it's not complicated, but you don't have to build these massive you know, infrastructure uh, resources. It should be... The entire company should. So you're leasing people, your uh, your salespeople, everybody needs to get comfortable with these tools. Uh, I mean, it always bewildered me that you could talk to any real estate professional, look at their phone, and they'll have every app imaginable, whether it's like you know an Instagram or a Spotify or an ESPN or whatever it is. And then it, when it comes to work, it's sort of like, oh, I, I don't, I don't know how to do anything. You take the time to invest in the things you love. You should do the same with things that you work on every day. So it's not that complicated. Well, I mean, you bring up a good point, though, too. Because one, it's uh, a two-pronged question for you on this one. How do you create that culture of (laughs) innovation? And then two, if it's starting from the top down, what if it's not? You know, what if you are right there and you want to spearhead uh, technology uh, as far as adoption within your organization because you happen to be really comfortable with it? You know, I, I can only sort of talk about my, my own experience, right? I'm, mm-hmm. I'm a, you know, 55-year-old uh, uh, dinosaur of a business <laughs> executive. Like, you know, I've been running my own companies for 30 years the same way. Um, and, you know, I'm not a tech guy. I'm not an engineer. I mean, I, I'm a college dropout. I'm barely literate. So, you know, I, I am not this sort of tech, you know, uh, evangelist because um, I'm so good at it. No, I'm, I'm not good at it. I, I struggle every day with, you know, every aspect of technology I personally struggle with. But I know that, you know, I've got to fight through it and I've got to get my company to operate as efficiently as possible. So, you know, it's, it's, it's on me as the CEO of my company just to be constantly looking out for new, innovative uh, ways to work, to operate, to communicate and to push myself and push my team. So, I, I mean, I can only really talk about myself. Um and it's it's tough. It's not easy. I mean, the old way is easy, but again, the the threat to our industry is if for those that don't adapt to innovation as core to their DNA, the outside world at large will not wait for you anymore. This threat of in a, of of lack of of adoption is every industry on earth now. I mean, I I could. So we could spend hours going through every other industry and how lack of innovation uh, destroyed industries. Now, is real estate industry going to be destroyed? No, but there are some real challenges that I could sort of foresee in the future. For instance, if some of these massive tech companies come in from outside our industry and they control all the data that exists in these buildings, both where people live or where they work, well, if if somebody else owns the data, whether it's you know, w- you know, sensors and energy and uh, workplace movement and uh, you know uh, how people are you know utilizing space, uh, if somebody if we give away all this data, well, what are we then as an industry? We're, we're bricks and mortar. We're just a shell, right? But we don't have the customer anymore. We lost it because we gave it away. That's happened in so many industry. So I think it's for incumbent upon every sort of leader or anybody that's in the industry to, to drive it within themselves is the, is the short answer, I guess, was a simplistic answer. I mean, you've got to, you got to, you got to get this. And if not, I, I you know, I don't know that, that I can teach you how to do it. Um, 
it just has to start from a sort of, uh, you know, priority within you at, at, at no, you know, whether you're 25 or 55 or 75, it's, it's not an, an old person's thing or a young person's thing. It's just, you know, it's how we have to all, um, look at the future and, and text threat and opportunity. It's a great Actually, perfect place to end. We've covered so much ground, and I can't thank you enough for joining me. I know there's uh, so much going on, and I appreciate you taking some carving out some time to talk with me today. Uh, with and with so much changing, um, especially in tech, uh, pretty much every day. I, I hope to have you back on to kind of uh, share more and keep us all up to date on that. Larry, I just want to also I just want to acknowledge you. Um, and you, all your support um, of Cree Tech and the industry at large, and also, of course, CCIM. I'm a huge fan of your organization, the great work that you all do in terms of education and innovation. Um, I mean, I'm a big fan of your podcast, listen to all your great guests, and it's been a real honor and a, a privilege to spend time with you. And I just want to really um, thank you again for all, all your leadership uh, in, in the past and particularly during times like this when um, the industry needs uh, platforms and communities like CCIM to come together. So thank you for all, all you've done personally and, and uh, to CCIM for all you do for our industry. No, thank you. It's like you said, it's a collaborative effort. It's really us together to uh, be able to share that information and get that out there to help all of the people that are in commercial real estate today to uh, adapt and kind of get through this together. So thank you so much. Thanks, Michael. Larry. Appreciate it. Best of luck to you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Commercial Investment Real Estate Podcast. Head to SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Join us next month for a brand new episode of Commercial Investment Real Estate Podcast featuring another leading figure from the world of commercial real estate. 